What's going on everyone? My name is Tyler and welcome to Port Canaveral, Florida. This is the second busiest cruise port in the entire country and Central Florida's cargo hub. And today I'm going to be taking you along as we learn more about this port from the ultimate set of experts, the Canaveral pilots. They're going to be answering some of the most frequently asked questions about being a pilot at this port and they were kind enough to give us this unbelievable insight to the operations of Port Canaveral. So make sure you are subscribed with the notification bell on and without further ado, let's go meet up with the Canaveral pilots. All right, everyone, we are now inside the pilot headquarters now here in uh, Port Canal, Florida, here with Sean Morrissey. Uh, and uh, Sean, thank you so much for having us here at the office. We greatly appreciate it. Um, so let's start off with the first question here. How long have you uh, been a state licensed pilot here at Port Canaveral and specifically, uh, and what did you do before moving to the role of becoming a pilot? Sure, uh, I've been a state licensed pilot in Port Canaveral for about seven years. Uh, I started in uh, September of 2015. And uh, before that, I kind of grew up here. I, I went to junior high school and high school here. And after college, I came back um, after sailing deep sea on tankers, container ships, and other kinds of cargo ships. Uh, I knew I wanted to be a pilot, and I knew I wanted to be a pilot in Florida. So I came back home, and uh, I ended up working on the casino ship right over here for uh, a little longer than I planned to. But uh, it was a great experience. I was captain on there for about four years, and uh, it allowed me to, to study and obviously to work. and be home every night, which is key. You don't get to yeah. do that in this industry a lot. So, so did that job really help you get experience learning? You know, the the port layout and self with the state exam. Yeah, I would say so. You know, when you're sailing deep sea, one of the things you don't really get is a lot of ship handling experience. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you come to a port, pilot gets on board, brings a ship in, and you're basically just as an officer up there. You're kind of overseeing the pilot, making sure that he's doing what he's supposed to do, and and you're making. Uh, entries into the logs and you're finding out the vessel's position, making sure we're on track. So you're not really doing the actual ship handling. Um, on the casino ship, um, I got to do a lot of ship handling. I mean, that was it. Uh, dock the ship, undock the ship, take it out. And uh, so I got a lot of ship handling experience. And yeah, I actually got my federal pilot's license while I was working there. So um, a lot of people don't know, but there's two types of licenses. There's a federal license and there's a state license. And I got my federal license while I was working there, which made things a little bit easier when I started here. Um, so what is an average day? I know this is a very vague question, right? Because average day, it depends on the day, right? But what does an average day uh, look like for you as a pilot? Sure. Uh, so we have four pilots on duty at any given time. Uh, and then usually we have a standby pilot that's, uh, that's off watch. So you have your day man. Uh, the day man uh, typically starts at six o'clock in the morning and you're the first phone call. You're the first guy that gets called between 6 a.m. and 6.30 in the, uh, in the evening. Um, that doesn't mean your day starts at 6. Actually, it usually begins a lot before then. Uh, usually our first cruise ship arrival is uh, you know, are between 4 and 5 in the morning. So um, even though it's nighttime, uh, if there's multiple pilot uh, or multiple ships coming inbound, then you're more than likely going to have to do one of those arrivals uh, as the day man. Mm -hmm. And then basically, uh, once the cruise ships are in port, uh, after the morning, then any cargo jobs and things, like I said, you're, as the day man, your phone rings first. And if I need help doing another job, then I'd call in a standby pilot and then a third or fourth and so on. After that, it's usually cruise, uh, cruise ship departures starting at about uh, 3.30 in the afternoon until six uh, in the evening. And um, same thing, if it's multiple departures, uh, I'll call in some extra guys to help out and uh, we'll move the ships out. Typically, uh, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday are the busiest uh, cruise ship days. Mm -hmm. um, Tuesday and Wednesday are kind of our slower days, but uh, we do have a lot of other, uh, we have a lot of cargo ships, uh, a lot of uh, vessels that su uh, support the commercial space industry that we move in and out of here quite a bit, and we do some Navy work too. So all of that kind of gets thrown into the mix, but um, yeah, so typically uh, zero six in the morning until about 1830 and then uh, the night guys take over and it's kind of the same situation. Uh, somebody else's phone rings first at night and if they need help, there's a pecking order in which they'll call uh, additional pilots in. Okay, that's awesome because yeah, I know definitely the daytime is so for you guys, it's definitely way more slower than the nighttime, right? Uh, you know what? The, yeah, I'd say, yeah, for the most part. Uh, typically, uh, with the cargo ships, um, you've got other factors to consider. Uh, labor, mm -hmm. uh, you know, usually labor is more expensive if they're working at night. Um, so, and then of course, when a ship uh, touches the dock, you know, the clock starts, they pay for uh, dockage, which renews every 24 hours. Um, so, and that's, that's the, the port authorities. Mm -hmm. um, that's part of their uh, fees that they charge. 
So basically, uh, if a cargo ship comes in, they want to minimize costs. So they'll want to start in usually right before the cruise ships. Cruise ships have priority in this port. Yeah. Um, so uh, cargo ships are secondary. Um, so they'll start in at you know two or three in the morning, get to the dock, so they can uh, clear customs and then start cargo at six o'clock in the morning because they want to leave you know as soon as they can after finishing and hopefully before that twenty four hour clock uh, comes around again. Okay, that makes a lot more sense. Um, so, what has been the most uh, exciting or scariest uh, events you have uh, faced while being a pilot here at Canaveral? So I'm going to choose to talk about exciting. Okay, yes. <laughs> and uh, for me. Every day is exciting. This job, this is my dream job. This is what I've always wanted to do, and I'm lucky enough to be able to do it. I mean, I, I have a lot of friends that you know they work in an office or they talk about working from home and this and that. And I, I have such an irregular schedule, but it's a great schedule. I mean, I can come to work and do a job. I can go pick the kids up from school. I can do whatever I have to do, and it's 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 great. And moving ships is is like I said, it's what I've always wanted to do. Um, it's that's the exciting part of this uh, of, of this career is is the job itself. All right. So after you get on board uh, and you're on board the bridge, what exactly are your responsibilities to get the vessel ready for depart to depart the pier? And what is the interaction between as you, the pilot, uh, and the master of the vessel you are piloting? All right. So it's pretty much the same for all you know all vessel types, cargo, crews. Um, I get on board. Uh, that's when the ship's making their final preparations. And I guess we're talking about departure. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, I get on board, I get up to the bridge, uh, we carry out what's called the master pilot exchange. And this is on all vessels. Uh, basically, it's, it's exactly what it, uh, what it says. It's a, it's a sharing of information about uh, the vessel, about uh, the intended maneuver, the transit, the channel, and then how we're gonna disembark the, uh, the pilot at the end of it. So we talk about weather conditions, uh, wind, tide, current, um, Summertime in Florida, we get a lot of thunderstorms, so we, you know, obviously we keep an eye on that. Uh, you know, decide if there are thunderstorms in the area, do we delay? Do we try to get out ahead of them? Uh, so yeah, weather is key. Uh, we talk about any uh, special characteristics of the ship, the propulsion, um, uh, any possible deficiencies the ship might have. Uh, maybe uh, they're down a bow thruster or uh, you know anything like that. Uh, we talk about that. Um, we talk about the maneuver itself, how we're going to do the maneuver. Um, we talk about uh, who has the con, navigational control, and uh, basically talk through from dock to pilot disembarkation before we actually do it. Uh, traffic in Port Canaveral, we have a dredge working right now, so uh, let them know where the dredge is, uh, talk about who's gonna communicate with them and handle any radio communications other than that. And uh, yeah, it's pretty much an overview of, of the maneuver. And then, and then we actually go and do it. And, I think that answers your question, right? Okay, so during departure sometimes, due to the weather, of course there has been times when some cruise ships are requiring uh, tug assistance. How do you direct the tug um, who are docking and uh, undocking the ship? Right, so cargo ships use a lot of tugs. Uh, a lot of cruise ships, depending on their propulsion uh, type, uh, will use tugs under certain conditions, uh, whether it's sustained winds over 20 knots or maybe more. And then you have other uh, Passenger ships, which use azipod propulsion, they generally have a lot of power. Um, doesn't mean they won't use tugs, but they're probably less likely. So, if we need a tug, you know, it's a decision that the uh, you know the master and and the pilot make, um, you know, together. Uh, usually, tugs in Port Canaveral are about 15 minutes until we can get one uh, once we make the call. And then it's basically, do we want to have the tug uh, made up with a line, or do we want to have the tug in a standby um, uh, situation where? Um, we don't think we need you, but we want you here just in case. And uh, once that decision's made, then that's what we do. As far as communicating with the tug, uh, each pilot, when we're on the job, we have a handheld uh, VHF radio, and that's how we actually pass uh, orders to the tugs, is via VHF. Okay, so now the ship, guys, everyone fought along again with this question here. The ship has now exited the channel, right? We're passing buoy number 12, I think, is the one. Um, you're passing and you're getting outbound to sea. Uh, you hit the Atlantic Ocean for the first time. The pilot boat hits the Atlantic for the ocean for the first time. Um, what do you and the pilot boat talk back and forth about what you guys need in order to safely disembark the vessel with the conditions of the Atlantic Ocean? Right, so this is obviously very important. It's near and dear to, to us pilots is getting off the ship safely. Uh, we generally have a pretty good idea. You know, we do this every day. So we have a pretty good idea of what it's gonna look like before we even leave this office. Um, uh, usually, before I leave, I'll, I'll talk to whoever the boat operator is and say, hey, what do you think? Starboard side in the channel, make a swing. 
But basically, once we get up there and uh, we see what it's like, then we'll talk on the VHF radio. We'll, we'll actually make that final determination. Um, we'll pick a side, starboard side, port side. Uh, in Port Canaveral, it's usually the starboard side, just based on the, on the prevailing uh, weather conditions. Um, and then the next question is, can we do it in the channel, or do we have to make a swing? We make a swing, we make a lee. So we put the weather on the other side of the ship, and it makes a nice smooth situation right on the side the pilot boat comes up on, and that makes it safer for us to get off. So yeah, basically we have a pretty good idea of, what, of what's gonna happen. Uh, we'll talk about it a little bit beforehand, and then once we get up there and see what it looks like, then we'll make the final decision. And like I said, it's side of the ship, and do we need a lee or not? And typically, uh, we'll have a speed reduction too. We'll, uh, here in Canaveral, and it's port specific, uh, we'll slow the ships down to about seven or eight knots, and that's the speed that we'll make the transfer at. And then as I leave the bridge and I make my way down to uh, the pilot disembarkation area, if something changes, then it's up to the pilot boat captain to call the bridge and let them know, hey, no, I want something different. Uh, you know, this isn't working out, and we'll go from there. Uh, captain Sean, thank you so much for coming. Hey, thanks very much. Us. Really we appreciate it. Really appreciate it here. Thank you. Great. Yeah, Dredge Harry asking our pilots. Harry is back. Hey, good afternoon. We're just getting geared up. We got uh, three cruise ships outbound. What's the status of that anchor, uh, your anchor buoy there in front of the Liberty? Is that still there, or uh, can we get that moved to give us a little more room to get out of there? Yeah, absolutely there, Kev. I'm getting my boat fired up now. We'll get it out of your way. Okay, Kev, sounds good. She's scheduled for 15.30. Uh, sounds like she's on time, and uh, we'll be talking to you again here shortly. Roger that. How did that go? Yeah, so basically, uh, shortly after taking the last line, I just took navigational control of the Carnival Liberty. Uh, we proceeded outbound. Uh, I directed our movements. And then once we got uh, in the vicinity of Buoy 5, uh, I had a small turnover with uh, what we call the navigator. That's the officer of the watch on board. And uh, once he was comfortable, I turned the con over to him. I relinquished the con, and then I headed down to uh, get off the ship. Uh, generally, in Port Canaveral, uh, we'll get on board about five miles offshore, and then depending on a vessel's draft, how deep they are, uh, we may or may not get off as early as the vicinity of Buoy 5. One of the reasons why we get on board further out on the arrivals is because uh, to give us, especially if it's at night, to let our eyes adjust to the night vision, and uh, also gives us more time to carry out that master pilot exchange before we hit the first pair of buoys. the V 
viewers what's happening right now with the uh, ship? Well, he was uh, he was alongside the uh, the berth here, facing facing the uh, to the west. So they had to drag him up into the middle basin, but there's enough room to spin it around. And he spun her 180, headed outbound now. Well, basically the tugs are just kind of running as an escort for him, and they're not pulling or, or, or pushing at this point. They're just there in case something happens. You know, past the dredge, and they'll dismiss the tugs and they'll continue on. And we'll go out and get them around five and six. This is the final job for the day, correct? For me, yeah. Actually, yeah, for the, for the pilots today, this is it. What do you recommend? Yeah, I think we can uh, still do the one three zero there if you can change out. Okay, roger that. Well, everyone, I hope you enjoyed this special video into the Canaveral Pilots. A big thank you to the pilots for the amazing hospitality and a warm welcome there. Again, really do appreciate uh, them allowing me to show you what happens on a daily basis uh, with them bringing the cruise ship and the cargo ships outbound for sea. A big thank you also to Captain Sean and Captain Mike for, of course, allowing us to ask them amazing questions like we did in the video. I've been your host, Tyler. And you're watching The Tyler Show.